Uh, oh, yes, it is working. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's David Broder. Uh, I'm Europe editor at Jacobin magazine. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, Jacobin's very pleased to host this event together with Sorkamp, uh, who are the publishers of the German translation of Quinn Slobodian's uh, latest book. Uh, of course, Quinn is uh, about to become professor of international history at Boston University. Uh, his books include um, Globalists, The End of Empire, and The Birth of Neoliberalism, and uh, new, in English, of course, Crack Up, Capitalism, Market Radicals, and The Dream of a World Without Democracy. Uh, so you can buy the German translation uh, from the table by the door. Uh, this discussion is all going to take place in English, though, uh, given my lack of German, and probably Quinn is a bit better, but... Uh, <laughs> So, um, we're going to have a uh, discussion uh, among ourselves about some of the themes of the book, uh, but then there'll be plenty of time for uh, questions uh, to Quinn uh, afterwards. Um, so, Quinn, I wanted to start off by talking about you know, where this book fits in historiography, but also about the way we think of the history of the last few decades. Uh, a certain kind of common sense, or maybe kind of liberal idea, uh, would paint it as, you know, in the 1990s, there's this moment of the world being connected, the end of borders and boundaries, the market finally uh, uniting the world. But then, in our own moment, some walls going back up, reassertion of the power of the nation state, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of question of globalism versus nationalism. And, and your, it seems that this book, uh, again, like globalists, seeks to, to question that kind of a vision. Yeah, um, yeah. Before starting, I just want to thank you, David, for being here, and everyone for joining. Having this like uh, New England alter globalization tapestry here behind us is really kind of perfect too. I don't think that was here last time I was there, and I, I nodded to this last time, but like this specific part of Berlin is very close to my heart. I was just remembering as I was crossing Corpus or Tor that. There used to be this big sign on top of that big, uh, the tower block across the street that it was, I think, for like a tourism agency or something. And the, the, there was always sort of tattered curtains and just like fabrics and shit just like drifting around that building to me. And I remember it was very romantic, easily aestheticized object that it would, like many things in Berlin, I used to look at and say, when that thing is gone... Berlin won't mean the same to me as it used to be. And this was one of the, again, many times that I walked across and I was like, well, that looks like shit. It looks like a refrigerator now. But I guess I'm going to have to come to terms with this new relationship I have to the city because my own aesthetics are not actually important in the end. Um, so that just by way of preface, thank you to all like my beloved friends also who came out tonight. Um, so then now to the 1990s <laughs> in historiography, like secondary issue, but... Yeah, no, what you say, David, is exactly the kind of genesis of the book. So it's kind of, and there's two moments. It's kind of 1989 and 2016, and they're linked. Because I think 2016 being the year of Brexit, the year of Trump, the year after was kind of the breakthrough of the Alternative for Germany party, was produced retroactively a certain story about the world since the end of the Cold War. Which was, which was sort of a nostalgic, uh, retroactively positive story that we had been in an era of relatively seamless globalization where everything was scaling upwards. Things were getting easier, more smooth since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And 2016 was the moment of the backlash, like the reverse movement. The drawbridges are rising, the walls are going up. We, we, I could show many images of this sort of in the pages of The Economist, but everywhere else too. And I think that that um, narrative rested on a kind of binary um, understanding of how the world works, that either we are in an era of globalization or we are in an era of nationalism. And these are kind of the only two relevant settings that... Those are the only ways that kind of political economy or world history kind of progresses. Either it scales up or it returns to the container of the nation state. And 
that seemed like a poor description of the world to me, actually. And the book is about a kind of introduction of a third category, actually, aside from the world and the nation, as I describe in the book, since 1989, and indeed before that, we had been sort of, you know, welcomed by a new category, and that's the category of the zone, that the way that capitalism had worked since the 1980s and accelerating since the 1990s was punching holes in the nation and saying, these spaces are different. These spaces have different laws. These spaces have different regulations. And these places become in particularly intense sites of manufacturing, financial services, extraction. And that if you use that sort of third term, you introduce that third space of the zone, then the 2016 moment starts to look quite different, actually. And the supposed backlash or the return of the 1930s, as it was often described, actually looks more like the, a front lash or a kind of movement into a new kind of hyper-accelerated form of capitalism, where all those, you work, you work on Italian nationalism, so I don't need to tell you this, that the supposed nationalists were often leaning even harder into forms of capitalist competition often by creating new zones within themselves, whether it's Orban or the PIS party, which in 2020 turned all of Poland into a special economic zone, or Maloney, who wants to turn the entire south of Italy into a single special economic zone. So in other words, maybe we're dealing with something a little bit more complicated here, which isn't just a pendulum swing from the globe back to the nation, but the globe to the nation, but now by way of this sort of wormhole of the zone, sort of back into an even more kind of zero-sum form of global competition. And, and um... Of course, often when we think of the history of the development of neoliberalism or its rise as sort of a hegemonic project, uh, of course, often that story is told, and it's a very familiar narrative of the history of Chicago boys, Chile, Thatcher and Reagan, and, and this kind of model of a authoritarian imposition of neoliberalism. And of course, you know, there's plenty of famous uh, citations from the likes of uh, Milton Friedman about the, the primacy of um, economic freedom as the basis of civil liberties rather than democracy as such. But here you're focusing on these zones, on these extraterritorial spaces, and of course with a great focus on China and on East Asia. So what does that story, or so what do those cases kind of allow us to tell? What story do they allow us to tell mm -hmm. that perhaps isn't there in the sort of Chilean model? Right. So the last book, I mean, the last time I was standing on this, sitting right here was four years ago to present the globalist book that had just come out in German. And that book kind of ends in Hong Kong Right? And it, it ends in Hong Kong the same way this book begins in Hong Kong, and kind of for the same reason, <clears throat> which is that I think that if you have a kind of working understanding of what neoliberal globalization is, you might think it's basically like, yeah, you have nations, you have democratic governments, but then you have like a set of constraints that sit on top of nations that make certain kinds of policies more likely than others and might even prohibit certain kinds of policies from ever becoming real, even if democracies want them. So <laughs> you don't have to reach very far in the German context right now to know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, the debt break is a perfect example of like the construction of a legal form of what I call in that book encasement that by design sort of limits what democracies can and cannot do. Other forms of supranational institutions, in some ways, the European institutions, in many ways, something like the World Trade Organization, are explicitly designed to sort of, in the metaphor that's often used, tie the hands of governments to prevent them from doing things that might be destructive to their own populations. So that's, I think, the usual um, understanding we have of how neoliberal global globalization has kind of progressed, is like, one set of constraints after the other, 
narrowing political imagination, narrowing possibility, and like producing one kind of future rather than others. The reason why Hong Kong was interesting to people like Milton Friedman and why I ended one book with it and started another book with it is that it was actually not about scaling up, right? It wasn't about creating a better kind of cage, if you like, for global capitalism. It was about sort of like fine tuning a smaller unit that could move more with more agility inside of that cage of global capitalism. And it could do so because it had somewhat like con through contingent reasons and somewhat magically like avoided a lot of the normal things that were happening in the 20th century. So Hong Kong never decolonized, right? Hong Kong remained a colony into the era of decolonization, straight into the late 1970s. The book begins with Friedman standing there in 1978. So it never had to um, deal with the problem of democracy in the first place, such that it needed to be overruled by a set of laws that would then constrain it. It just never introduced it in the first place. So you could govern Hong Kong like a corporation as it was celebrated as being governed in the late 1970s because you never had democracy at all. What became fascinating for the people like Milton Friedman, and this is really what the whole Crack Up Capitalism book is about, is what if instead of trying to save capitalism by scaling up and creating ever more elaborate forms of supranational law, you save capitalism by scaling down and creating miniature Hong Kongs inside of existing nation states. So from the late 1970s, that's this kind of the story I tell. It's not like the story of Pinochet, which is like roll out an authoritarian government at the national level and like destroy existing trade unions, destroy existing political parties, and in, impose a, a, a new policy at the level of the kind of the nation state you'd see on the map. Instead, it's it's an attempt it's attempt to sort of avoid the problem of democracy through a kind of micro solution. And the example there would be something like the Isle of Dogs or the Canary Wharf in London, which was in the middle of a city in the late 1970s, early 1980s that was governed by a pretty far left labor entity called the Greater London Council. Uh, if you want to find a kind of positive story in this book, then follow the thread that, that I start in the book about the Greater London Council, because they were doing things that people are only catching up to now. They were concerned about the environment. They were concerned about positions of immigrants and questions of language. They were concerned about daycare, feminism, the responsible use of technology. All in like 1982, they were interested in bringing subculture into politics. So hosting like reggae concerts and punk concerts, teaching people how to use computers in an interesting way in their own native language. They're just doing incredible things that like nobody has caught up to yet. So how did Thatcher respond? And this is sort of like a micro story about the whole book. By creating a kind of island inside of the Greater London Council, which was like a liberated zone for hardcore capitalism, where the Greater London Council had no say, and where instead it was backdoor deals between real estate developers and Whitehall, whereby, you know, they got a, a light rail out to Canary Wharf. They got super sweetheart deals on the, on the land. And they were able to build a kind of second financial district in the middle of London that looked nothing like the world that the Greater London Council was imagining. So this is like, a, this isn't the same as Pinochet, right? It's not like they storm the, the presidential palace, tear out the democratically elected president or you know, force him to suicide. And then, in, and then impose an authoritarian military government. Instead, it's, it's what the French philosopher Grégoire Chamayou calls the kind of termite strategy, where you sort of eat away at small parts of the territory and institutions to kind of um, undermine from inside other forms of solidarity or other forms of politics and living that might otherwise take root. So, I mean, one thing that... that um, I find interesting in the the Hong Kong example in the book, and and uh, it's the way it's cited by kind of British thinkers, and you know this is a book that 
is of course focuses a lot on you know it's an intellectual history right so it's about these experiences but it's also about the way these think tanks these authors are reflecting on these examples and generalizing them mm -hmm. so you know the hong kong example is interesting uh, also because of the way it's discussed as a model for for britain so it's not just about kind of carving out extraterritorial spaces but also about kind of learning lessons from them or importing their example mm -hmm. also into um, countries like Britain, and, and with the, the Isle of Dogs mention, uh, example you mentioned, um, one of the interesting things is uh, you talk about uh, Keith Joseph, who was uh, Thatcher's first uh, Secretary of State for Industry and Trade. And he's speaking at this conference in 1978, just before she's elected, and someone asks a question, you know, why not make one island, uh, the Isle of Wight, you know, just off the coast of Hampshire, why not make that socialist and create another area where there's like no tax, no regulation, and compete, make them compete. Mm -hmm. And he like kind of agrees with the question, right? He says kind of, yes, like what we need to do is create these areas where there's the queen's writ does not rule, where there's kind of free market laboratory. But, but you, you show even from then a kind of contradiction, right? Which is that on the one hand, there's this idea of creating this free space, the market protected from politics and democracy, but then that always seems to come through through the back door. No, the, the state intervention is actually necessary for what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I had that, funnily enough, that exact same thought experiment posed to me by someone who was a kind of uh, consultant for zoning. That, you know, he knew that my politics were different. But then he said, well, wouldn't you just want to be able to see, like, what if we had, like, one ter island that was governed by my politics and one by yours? We could just see how they fare, like which one does better over time. And I mean, my two things to say about that. My, my first reaction was like, which islands are we talking about here, right? Because I think like in the end, as a historian, this, the, the, this book is about like these thought experiments coming down to earth and then on earth, like existing populations being like, what the fuck are you doing to this part of earth that I live on, right? I mean, like more often than not, that's what it is. It's like whether it's Honduras, or Singapore or, or, or Dubai, it's sort of the arrival of a particular model and then like all kinds of frictions and, and like um, the sort of the, the lack of the smooth applicability of a thought experiment in the kind of the, the thickness of, of human relations and actual geographies. So there's that. But on the other hand, I kind of welcome that thought experiment because I do think that our own political imagination has been like too captured by those two settings that I mentioned. So that kind of the nation or the, or the world. And, you know, either you want sort of top level um, international treaties and Kyoto style agreements, or you're embracing kind of nationalist um, Hobbesian kind of zero sum politics. But I think that the, the scale of politics below that is like, actually often much more exciting and more vital and often ignored. And if, if you can say something for the people in, in my book is like, they're completely promiscuous in the way that they'll like recombine, hybridize, think together things you never would think would be put together. So there's one chapter, for example, if you haven't had a look at it, where there's like a Dutch libertarian goes to Somalia in the middle of the civil war and says like, what if we combined Somali customary law with 21st century commercial law and made that into a kind of a white businessman's clan that could then, you know, organize a free port around its own stateless, totally private principles. I mean, I'm simultaneously totally repelled by that as like a proposal for politics, but I'm also like, hats off, like you went all the way, like you went really hard with your imagination of like how the world might look in ways that, to be honest, I feel like we sometimes are too constrained actually in our own ways of embracing those more speculative versions of politics. And, and I think that's because even though we should feel like we're in a sense of a moment of existential crisis, and I think many of us do, I think that the right and the libertarian right in particular actually feels a sense of apocalypse impending almost more profoundly than people on the left, even if they're totally sensitized to things like the rising temperatures and so on do. I think that 
if you if you analogize the moment right now to that of that of debates happening between communists and social democrats in a place like Germany in 1910 or 1920 that's kind of where libertarians are now in 2010 and 2020 the same way that a communist in 1910 or 20 in Germany would say global capitalism is in a terminal crisis it's about to implode there's no way out of this. There's no way it can stabilize. We need to take action now or else things are going to get much worse very, very quickly. That, since 2008 especially, is a place where a lot of kind of anarcho-capitalists and libertarians are. And I think you can't understand kind of Bolsonaro and Malay without seeing that there's that sense of kind of global conjuncture for them um, that for young people draws them to something that from the outside seems quite extreme and even self-destructive and, um, you know, irrational even. But it's really that, I think it's that sense of, um, of rupture, kind of world historical rupture that I try to capture through the often bizarre thought worlds that my protagonists, they kind of dream up for themselves. So, I mean, um, one of the uh, libertarians who uh, replied positively to your book in a quite bizarre way was uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, who was the chancellor of the Exchequer under Liz Truss for six weeks last year. And in his review of your book, um, he basically took your book as an ode to freedom. And so he, 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 he says this kind of, like at one point he kind of says, well, uh, Bantustan, which he thinks is a country, but he's referring to your example of Siske, the Bantustan in South Africa. He says, like, this is an example of like striving for human freedom. Like people want to free themselves from these um, uh, from states and tyranny. Um, but you know, he's someone who has advocated the idea of Britain after Brexit becoming Singapore upon Thames. And a lot of the reaction to this idea of Singapore upon Thames is to say, well, actually, this isn't this libertarian utopia you think of. Like, it's not just uh, an economy where the state retreats and the market fills in, right? There's, you know, massive sort of state-run development corporation, state ownership of land, and so on. So when we talk about these, you know, in your book, in, you know, in the subtitle, it says market radicals. At points, you say kind of libertarians or, or whatever. Like, how much are these tribes actually sort of fighting against each other, like if you compare them to social democrats and communists in the 1920s or whatever, you know, how much is there a, a struggle between those who want to use state power to, to neoliberal ends and then those who do seek some sort of more utopian uh, idea of a, of a, of a non-state uh, economy? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the challenge of the book is to kind of try to historicize the very recent past and I knew that I was kind of writing about the 90s when I started this book, but then the more I wrote, a, wrote it, I realized I was also really writing about the early 2000s. And specifically for me, the invasion of Iraq by the United States started to feel more and more like a kind of a signature moment in recent global history for a very particular reason in this case, which is it was just a kind of a disregard for the idea of national sovereignty as a kind of absolute principle that needed to be respected in any way. So, you know, I was alive for that moment and I knew that it was a moment of pure kind of arbitrary decisionism, actually, that the United States was just like, we're just gonna fucking do this. We don't care. Like that lip talk we were giving to international law just completely walk, just walking over that. And what that did is I think is it opened up this space of political thinking for the worst, actually, but you know, that totally renormalized ideas of empire, which had been considered to be sort of put out of commission or had considered to be like lapsed into anachronism, right? Like are, are countries still allowed to do this? Like, are you, can you just march into a country and try to transform its, political system internally. And so there was the initial sort of burst of enthusiasm by people like Neil Ferguson and Michael Ignatia for like, ah, empire's back, wonderful. But then I think almost more importantly, there was the second reaction, which was like, the way America's doing it is bad, but let's do it another way. 
And so the Paul Romer charter city example I use in the book is really like the way that British colonialism was given kind of new oxygen by Belgian colonialism, right? Like you needed to have the really bad empire to basically whitewash like less bad empire. And I think that a lot of the, the sort of Silicon Valley based um, embrace of state making and future making that I describe in the book that in a way, you know, has its kind of, you know, its heirs in people like Quasi Quartang is, is a kind of, it's a, it's a rejection of kind of bureaucratic, militaristic empire, but it's an embrace of the adventurism and like the speculative side of well, actually the more private version of like freebooting empire. So when Paul Romer advocates, for example, you know, Cuba giving Guantanamo Bay to Canada to be recolonized and then advocates creating new zones that could be like private city states in Honduras that could be sold to investors, which eventually does actually end up happening. What that is to me is like a revival of a kind of mid 19th century empire, like almost before, you know, British East India Company rather than the Raj. Right. Like it's kind of like a, it's actually kind of like a, uh, a respect for the power of private enterprise and private companies as world makers. And the power that Silicon Valley was given in the early 2000s as the kind of solution factory for all of America's governance problems, I think absolutely got externalized. And we're sort of still like living with the consequences of what it would mean for for states to kind of renege on their, even their own power and to give that power back to private actors. And that's, is what the quasi Quartang and Liz Trust moment was, was it was a leap of faith in the market as having a wisdom that was superior to that of any kind of publicly elected bureaucrats or even sort of like academics for sure. It was like, a belief in the magic of the market having a kind of mystical quality in and of itself, which is that what the, the, the most visionary people in this sort of crack up capitalism world think that, you know, the world is Im fallen. It is imperfect. We have given too much power to states. Were we to strip states tomorrow of all the authority they have, we might not have a good world, but we would have a marginally better world. And if nothing else, we would have one that had a bit more personal liberty than the one we have now. That's their gambit. And they, they recognize it's a high risk one. So David Friedman, and we haven't mentioned the Friedmans yet, but Milton Friedman is in there, but so is his son, David Friedman, the most important thinker of anarcho-capitalism and the founder of the most important medieval reenactment camp in the United States. So is his grandson, Patry Friedman, Google software engineer and founder of the Seasteading Institute. And David Friedman has a very interesting line for me where he says, you know, once we take power completely away from states and give them to private actors, we may not actually have a better world, but it's a chance we have to take, right? And so that kind of voluntarism and that sense of the leap is, I think, at least useful to understand why this thing that is otherwise sort of often disgusting and inhumane would be attractive to people who feel desperate or who people like Quasi Quartang are like kind of intellectual, um, you know, gourmets that like to try bits and tastes of everything. And so in this case, he like liked the thought of trying something that was a forbidden sort of fruit. So when we talk about these kind of neo-medievalist ideas, like obviously it can seem a bit like uh, LARPing, also because as you talk about, you know, David Friedman, like uh, um, dresses like an early 20th century Berber aristocrat only eats with his right hand, uh, calls non-Muslims sort of heathens and non-believers. Yeah, this kind of thing. Um, but um, you also, I mean, when you talk about this like neo-medievalism, the ideas that drawn from that, I mean, does that also include a kind of civilizational 
vision. Because you know, when we talk about this idea of states collapsing or the modern order collapsing, it can seem that that also has a kind of idea of uh, a kind of ethnic aristocracy mm -hmm. as well in terms of uh, the survival of um, sort of small and secessionist civilizational groups, uh, which kind of combine these kind of neo-medievalist ideas, but also perhaps kind of more Randian idea of the kind of the the um, uh, the men of mind, this kind of thing. That, that these are like trailblazers; that they're actually kind of superior. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is based on, you know, just following through a simple thought experiment, which is like, if the government were to vanish tomorrow, then what kind of society would emerge afterwards, right? First of all, it wouldn't be a society in the sense of being something that was unified, because that only exists kind of because of a state. So what it would be would be something that would be composed of much smaller communities, that would find their way to each other because of a common set of existing relationships and then existing principles, right? I mean, it's not that hard to imagine in, in Berlin if like there were no state tomorrow, you know, everyone in this room would somehow find their way probably to each other in some kind of formal, informal way. And so the, the anarcho-capitalist proposition is just like, what if we planned ahead for that? What would that look like, right? So in one, in one way, it would mean setting the ground, as they say, you know, building the shell of the future world inside of the corpse of the current one. So, you know, anarchists would say that, but anarcho-capitalists would say it too. So you do things like you set up gated communities that are based on private contracts so you can have private security. But you also ask yourself, well, like, what keeps, what's the glue that keeps humans together in the first place? And the strange alliances that have sprung up between people who believe in quote unquote liberty and people who are often open racists are often that that alliance happens as an answer to that question, which is that, well, if people have the same race, then they tend to um, trust each other more and they tend to believe that they might be able to live in a community together better. So there's a reason why in the 1990s, Murray Rothbard, who is the sort of father of anarcho-capitalism, starts working with neo-Confederates who want to bring back the old white American South because the feeling is, well, when the state dis dissolves, then we'll need to reproduce kind of community at the smallest level. And so that will ease transaction costs and it will create a kind of like common space within which we can um, refine um, kind of uh, an existing and a functioning sort of social order. So I think that the big story for me is less like civilizationalism because to me that scales up again too much, like the West will rise, the East will fall. It's, it goes down actually. So the big story for me is the end of modernization as a temporality. So the 20th century I think was really marked by this idea that every little self-determining unit in the world composed of a territory, a, na uh, a language, and an ethnicity would eventually converge and we would all eventually experience some kind of high industrial modernity, consumer capitalism, a relatively advanced form of living. That was what everyone believed at the time of decolonization in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, or at least that's what they were encouraged to believe by the United Nations, by the mainstream economic theory. Why the zone for me is important or interesting is it shows that that mythology is gone now, right? In practical terms, it's gone because the places that get wealthy in post-colonial countries are very small places and they are, the, the wealth is not redistributed and not actually shared across the population. So this would be the work of someone like James Ferguson, who I've learned a lot from the anthropologist, who says that, you know, capital doesn't flow, it hops. So it hops from one place to another, and often then it hops out. It hops from one zone to another. It might hop in as investment in a mine in, um, in Zambia, but then it might hop back out to a tax haven as the wealth that was actually extracted is then spirited out of the country by elites or by um, the corporate investors in the first place. So that modernization fantasy is long dead. 
But when you realize that the geography even of capitalism has also moved on from the nation into this pontalist perforated world of zones, then it, th you realize two things. One, much of the world has been left behind and it's abject and it probably won't ever profit in this way. But also these little points in these zones have become a new horizon of politics for other people. So people who say, that's good. We want it to be broken up. We don't want to share. We want to think about politics as being local and based on a principle of secession and based on a principle of dissolution. And so let's, mook, let's work towards that. Let's act towards that. So the people you're talking about, of course, have a very elitist vision of this opting out secession. Uh, and of course, we take the example as well. Maybe we'll go on to discuss more. This idea of the global freedom class, which is a particularly disgusting uh, expression. But I kind of wonder, though, I mean, th you're talking about this idea of basically protecting wealth and markets from politics, from democracy. Um, but I wonder also what, what potential it has, given the kind of failure of the dream of modernization you talk about, yeah. what potential this actually also has to become a source of democratic legitimacy. If I think, for example, in Britain after Brexit, uh, it has been promoted this idea of turning uh, relatively uh, poor and deindustrialized coastal cities into free ports. Yeah. So there's this idea which is like, we will bring investment to your city by getting rid of these mm -hmm. uh, labor rights and regulations and so on. Uh, or uh, for example, I mean, we could even draw a parallel perhaps with things like uh, the hosting of the Olympic games, where the given city will enjoy some sort of onrush of investment, but in exchange for like a curtailing of its um, of certain established rights and standards and so on. So I wonder wh whether you think it, it is destined to remain a sort of elite project or whether it can be sort of rolled out. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things to say there. One is it's sort of like half the book is just me describing empirically by drawing on the work of a lot of anthropologists and geographers and, and other sociologists that, that this, what I call kind of like functional fragmentation after the end of the Cold War is kind of just a fact of the world. So if you are a poorer country and you want people to come invest, you set up a zone. It's not like this is something that only sort of freaky libertarians are thinking about. That's just like the machinery of like everyday development from the point of view of, of um, the, the sort of, um, if you're reading the UN Commission on Trade and Development or kind of mainstream UN sources, zones is how it gets done. Zones is also how you kind of externalize development. So we haven't talked about this yet, but one of the interesting things about the book is like if you look at it from the imperial point of view, the British, you know, set up their domination of the Indian Ocean world, for example, by setting up a series of coaling stations and refueling ports and military bases and free ports, in fact, all along the coast of, of India into Southeast Asia, the Arabian Peninsula. And if you look at the very places that they used to be uh, present, those ports are now governed by, owned and operated by basically two actors, Singapore owned um, logistics companies and Dubai owned logistics companies. So that footprint of empire has now been reversed by um, entrepreneuring externally motivated um, investors from really specifically Singapore and Dubai. India is an example that has been more domestically focused until recently. Uh, people have probably heard of Adani. Adani Ports and Special Economics is the Special Economic Zones is the name of the company. They've started to go kind of global recently too, um, specifically along what's called the India Europe Middle East cor Security Corridor that links Mumbai to Riyadh to Piraeus by way of Haifa. So Adani now owns and operates the port in Haifa, which is not the sort of explanation for why Modi has turned a 180 on his relationship to Palestine and Israel, but it's part of that longer story, right? So I think part of the story I'm telling in this book is like if you kind of put on the zone glasses, like as in like they live 
right? John Carpenter film, like you just start to see zones instead of nations. You won't explain everything, but you'll see a lot about how influences extended um, beyond national borders, um, how interests are kind of concentrated in places that they maybe hadn't been before. So that's the kind of, I think there's like that empirical side. Then there's the right wing side, which is like, let's take the zones and go one step further and turn those into like a new kind of polity, not just something that states use for their own purposes of accumulation. The question you're asking is kind of like, can that be flipped? Like, can the left embrace that logic of the zone, that form of political geography and kind of turn it into something good instead of something bad? The examples you use in Britain, right, the free ports is, you know, that's the story I tell in the book from 1979 to 2023. That's kind of like the British Conservative Party's only idea for reindustrializing the North. It's like lift labor legislation, give tax holidays, turn like Teesside into a next Jabal Ali free zone. I mean, it was going to happen in 1979. It's definitely not going to happen in 2023. Can you do something else there? So people have tried and people have suggested that you could. The Scottish National Party is trying to do green free ports where they actually raise environmental regulations and raise labor standards in the free port. Wales is doing the same. Um, whether that will be attractive to investors is another question, I think, right? So I think this is one of those situations where the zoning technology will only be you know, recuperable for the left if states are empowered to use the zones in those new ways. So, for example, the kind of carbon border adjustment tax that the EU has introduced and that the United States is introducing, if states and or the EU level says we will invest beyond our own national or EU space if zones reach a certain standard, then you could see that as a way to kind of like do a more battle to the top instead of battle to the bottom by way of specific sites of experimentation. But that just is really premised on turning the whole logic of this enterprise in a different direction than it's been going since it started. I mean, since Puerto Rico and Taiwan introduced export processing zones in the 1950s, they're there for one reason, which is low wage labor getting around existing regulations and avoiding oversight. They are black sites of kind of global capitalism. To try to turn them into like the reverse is like, you know, that's a big ask. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I theoretically I can see it being done, but I think more likely now the sites of hope for me are less special economic zones like turning positive and more sites of like municipal socialism and kind of community land trusts and cooperativism at a local scale, not through a zoning technology explicitly, but introducing like forms of decommodified exchange or the things that could become more attractive for emulation sort of outside of the normal channels of investment. So, one thing you you said in your, your previous answer was kind of referred to the fact that these zones often sort of take over the infrastructure or at least the kind of geographic location of sort of um, some of the sort of outposts of empire. And you use this phrase, um, this idea of empires being kind of lumpy, being made of um, sort of many different types of, of jurisdiction. Uh, it's a phrase from Lauren Benton. And you know, when she talks about that, She's referring also to the fact that the uh, the actual kind of material uh, means of imperial control demand these different types of jurisdiction, right? So, for example, by uh, seaports or or towns along riverbeds are more easily controlled than inland areas. Just just by way of example. So, my question really is kind of to what extent is there a a, a vision, a market radical vision? of sort of breaking out of that kind of territorial jurisdiction or, or, or base altogether. Uh, of course, you, you mentioned the, 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 the book by um, William Rees Mogg and um, who's the other author? Um, Dale Davidson. Right, so, so this idea of, you know, the, 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 uh, basically the idea that the digital and online world has been used in that way can kind of create this, uh, another space. Territorialized kind mm -hmm. of, yeah. 
So, so, to, so, how far are we actually seeing sort of that playing out? That, uh, that, that, you know, that things like you know, Bitcoin and so on are creating possibilities for for conquering areas of control that aren't uh, territorially uh, rooted in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think you know a lot of this kind of zone fantasies or zone dreams kind of just rely on a lot of like amnesia and repression of existing things, right? And like part of it is forgetting the world, like it's forgetting the existing geographies. It's very hard to change the fact that certain places are like choke points of global shipping. Like Singapore will always be important because it sits in like the Straits of Johor that links like the Indian Ocean to the South China Sea. And so to say you want to be a new Singapore, it's like, well, then you also need like new ways that the tectonic plates shifted, like from the <laughs> movement from Gondwana land to the present or whatever. Like it's only going to be there. Um, and we haven't talked about gender questions, but like a lot of this is also about like repressing un paid labor and also poorly paid labor in the form of on un um, recognized citizenship claims in places like Singapore and Dubai, which only work because 75% of the population can be deported and fired at will. And so if you want to make post-Brexit Britain into Singapore, but also shut down immigration, it's not clear how you're going to pull that one off. So, you know, the blind spots like pile up, in other words, like, like it's, it's, it's kind of, it's extremely easy actually to just like point out all the things that are being forgotten and ignored here. And even when it comes to creating sort of a cloud country as Balaji Srinivasan proposes or the proposal that crypto will sort of break the bond with territorial states. I mean, at, I mean, no, like it hasn't happened, right? It hasn't happened and it won't happen. I mean, the, you know, as some people in this room have written about, even the data centers uh, rely on rushing water and, you know, it, patches of territory. The Bitcoin relies on enormous amounts of energy that's generated out of conventional and non-conventional means. So the idea of escape is always a fantasy and a kind of a will of the wisp. And I think, which means one of two things, either it's a waste of time to spend any of your life thinking about it, which, you know, to be honest, I've wondered that sometimes, um, or the, it's a symptom of a deeper form of capitalism that we're dwelling in now. And then the question is that of the intellectual historian, which is like, what made anyone think that was possible? You know, what were the conditions that made that thinkable, that ridiculous thing, you know? And then, and then if you turn that around, it becomes an indictment of the rest of us because like we are all at fault for making that <laughs> thought thinkable, right? And then, and, and it's, it's deeply kind of like telling about the set of conditions that we've set up in our societies that those fantasies of escape can become indulged by so many people. So I think that's the kind of the effort that I'm making in the book is to like, draw attention to these things, not because I think they're actually leading us to a world designed by Peter Thiel, you know, where we all live in a zone. I don't actually think so. I give many reasons why I don't think that's true. But I also think that by exploring kind of like the far end of the intellectual zeitgeist, we can learn something actually about um, leaps of adventurous logic that we maybe sometimes are ourselves unwilling to take. And also something about like the material conditions that have have nurtured those kind of delusions. Because I, I'll just say as a as a as a final question. I mean, one thing I'm interested in is how the left reacts. What do we have to say about this? Because uh, you know, I'm I'm a historian mainly of the period of World War II, right? So okay, let's take an example, Monaco. Yeah, at the end of World War II, the end of the French Resistance mainly communist partisans, took over Monaco and controlled it militarily for several months. And there was a debate in the French Communist Party between proclamation of you know, the People's Republic of Monaco and in Pierre Abramovich's book, there's an interesting, kind of very romanticized idea, like the croupiers in the casino and the hotel maids who are like, armed and they're finally like in charge. <laughs> right, but that's, the proletarian Mon Monaco casino doesn't work. Right. So the French Communist Party like, well, don't do anything, sit tight for a bit, and we'll lobby to annex to France, which doesn't happen in the end. 
But at least in that context, it's kind of easy to see what the alternatives are. Like we can see why the annex to France version is probably the more realistic and better. But like, what do we do now? Like when there's these micro states, which are very powerful, uh, what, what would their left wing and internationalist vision look like? Is it just, you know, we support the, you know, um, Bangladeshi workers who are building Dubai who are rebelling against their bosses? Like, what, what would it actually look like to sort of incorporate those into a democratic and international order? Yeah, I mean, there is obviously a whole parallel narrative to this one about versions of the creation of temporary autonomous zones, if I can drop a loaded category, um, right, since 1989, that were also invested in sort of um, sites of like local, uh, you know, um, delimited transformations of relationships of decision making and political economic value um, that have, it's been very rich and and kind of varied and robust. I mean, actually, the last 35 years has probably had as many on the ground experiments in creating different worlds in miniature on the left as it has on the right. The difference is that they were often very quickly extinguished, um, you know, either externally or internally. Um, so I think there's a, there's an important narrative of kind of the opposition to the world I'm describing here. The world I'm describing here th flourished because it was plugging into the kind of needs of uh, financialized um, global capitalism at the time that it did, and so and it didn't seek it. It produced as little resistance as possible, rather than producing as much resistance as possible. So the Greater London Council that I mentioned earlier is is a perfect example of that. I, I mentioned this sort of metaphorically, but um, they in the Isle of Dogs, they got a kind of a barge from a local bargeman and rode it upstream in the Thames. Uh, after having decorated it like a dragon because the the flow of the Thames looks a bit like a serpent or a dragon and then delivered their demands to Whitehall. And they did this a few years in a row. It was quite like a big, spectacular thing. But I pose that against what David Harvey says about Canary Wharf, which is it's as if the city of London had drifted down the Thames and implanted itself just downriver as a kind of a duplica of itself. And I sort of say that, you know, it's not surprising that one happened and the other did because the dragon was going against the stream and the city duplicate, its double in Canary Wharf was going with the stream down to the ocean. And so, you know, in poetic metaphorical terms, I think that's the difference between like zones of the left and zones of the right. I mean, you try to go upstream it's a lot harder. There's more, much more resistance. It's much more likely you won't make it than the ones that are going kind of with the flow of the tide. Um, hey, so um, we've got plenty of time for uh, questions. Maybe I'll take a, a couple at a time. So. Uh, Do we have a microphone? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. There's one back there. David. Hi. Is this working? Okay. Um, I, I'm kind of, you set this up as complicating, you know, this sort of fantasy of a pendulum swing between a more globalized world or a sort of nation state backlash, um, which is, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jesus, that's loud. Um, but I was kind of wondering what about this is actually specific about the late 20th and 21st century. Is it that the zones are specific or is it this moment of decolonization, which is a fantasy that both misrecognizes empire as, you know, Britishness, Frenchness, whatever, um, rather than capital, and at the same time sort of fantasizes a world of nation states that never existed. I mean, when you describe the zones in abstract terms, it pretty much just sounds like the corporate charter to me, um, which goes back to absolutist monarchies where, you know, governments outsource governance yeah. to private actors, so. Absolutely. No, and I think that's exactly the right impression to get because in fact, the story that I'm telling is one where 
this sort of interregnum of believing in the nation was actually kind of strange. And so the the era before it and the era after it looked a lot more like each other than in some ways the era between. So the diversity of arrangements in the era of merchant empires where charter companies were off doing the business of empire and setting up just strange arrangements with local, either local sovereigns or local um, authorities or just founding their own kind of customized um, version of a free port or a, a concession or whatever it was. It had that quality of kind of pixelated mosaic strangeness that we sort of thought that the era of high modernization had smoothed out. So the vision we have of the world map where there's just like 200 some odd, na odd nations and they're each these kind of nice clean spaces um, is the one that was the kind of curiosity of the mid 20th century maybe. And since the 1980s, what I'm describing with special economic zones is like an identifiable trend, right? It's like they were introduced at one point, they didn't exist, and then suddenly there was many, many, many of them. So there were like 85 of these things in 1975, and now there's over 5,000 special economic zones which exist inside of nations with a different legal status than the land outside of them. So I think that what you're describing, you know, you're a historian, so you have that longer perspective, like that sense of like, this sounds familiar is like exactly right, actually, is it's the delusion of the moment when we thought that national sovereignty was meaningful in the mid-century, at the moment of independence, maybe, which if you're, you know, Kwame Nkrumah, for example, it doesn't last long. It's about you know three years after after independence, and you're like, holy shit! Actually, neo-colonialism is worse than colonialism, because now we're totally subjugated, but we can't even make claims as colonies. We're just we have this fake political independence, even though we're still economically subordinated. So it's it's an, it's a deepening a realization of that, which is I think the first part of what you said, but then made even more real through this sort of legal strategy of isolation and kind of, um, and um, fragmentation. Hello, I'm uh, Malte Kornfeld, uh, editor from Keynesian newspaper called Macroscope. And um, I'm very interested in the current situation of this yeah, so-called libertarian movement. Um, as we saw in the news, there was this election in Argentina and uh, Javier uh, Millet won. And he's uh, self-called, like, I think he says he's an ANCAP, so uh, an anarcho capitalist And um, I'm very, yeah, I don't know what will happen. So is there maybe an idea of uh, building zones or it's just like we take the dollar and then we continue doing like we are getting closer to the West or is there a real uh, perspective on these ideas he has? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the front page of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung day before yesterday was Der Anarcho Kapitalist, like He's self-described as anarcho-capitalist. So I think the question is like, do we take him seriously? Like, what does that mean? Does he believe that? If so, what would anarcho-capitalist politics, which are based on the elimination of states, mean when someone has been elected to the head of state, right? It's already a bit of a logical problem to figure that one out. I think that my opinion is, you know, I think he's best understood along the model of what's called the paleo-libertarianism, which is the connection between, as I described before, people who believe in the market and private order, but who realize that markets and private order also need something else that's extra economic to stabilize them. And so they always move to conservative social values. So they move to patriarchy first, often racism, then either at the same time as patriarchy or just after. And 
the Millet model is sh showing this very clearly, right? I mean, there's, I was uh, talking to people about this on social media, but, you know, he's combined the ministries of education, labor, and health into the ministry of human capital, which at first would seem extremely neoliberal, Gary Becker. But the woman who is now in charge of the Ministry of Human Capital is trained at an Opus Dei university, and her uh, education is in emotional education and mindfulness, and she's virulently anti-abortion and pro-life you know, conservative. So already it's like, <laughs> what? And it would seem almost impossible to understand if you didn't see there was actually a pretty strong tradition of this, which is like combining hardcore market principles with hardcore social conservative principles. If anyone, the predecessor to this is most recently Bolsonaro, who clearly used like a militarism, masculinism, authoritarianism on the one hand, with a youth movement that was very driven by these kind of like anarcho-capitalist online um, you know, social Darwinist kind of understandings of fighting in the market. Um, as to what will happen as a result, I mean, he's interesting, right? Because he has a pretty mainstream, actually, CV, if you just look at his the things that he's done. I mean, this is what I've written about recently myself. You know, he's, he's, he described himself as an economist. He's written a lot of academic articles. He obviously got support from Maurizio Macri and Charlotte Bullrich, the center rightist, the responsible politicians. So there is reason that people have to believe that he will not destroy the state, that he will, in fact, because of his small representation in parliament, will not be able to do the most radical things he wants to do. And that will actually just sort of, you know, the markets reacted very positively to his election. Um, I think it's possible that he will be tamed by the institutional kind of expectations of the global capitalist apparatus to prevent him from sort of going as far as he would like, um, or as far as he is using the aura of claiming that he wants to do, right? So I think a lot of it is just uh, cosplay, literally. And and that spectacle has been very attractive to people who are looking for a way to be as provocative as possible in a place where there doesn't seem like many other good political options. Um, but it is remarkable because it's definitely the first time that you had someone who described themselves as an anarcho-capitalist being the head of state. And for the anarcho-capitalist world, this is like... <laughs> their coming out party, right? They're very excited, right? There's like, you know, if you go online, you can see like reading lists, like in case you're just hearing about anarcho-capitalism, like here's somewhere to start. Here's the 20 books you should read right now. And once you start going into that world, like it gets worse and worse and worse. Like it's like, it's not just the kind of stuff he's doing, but you know, it really is a dream of breaking up the world into racially homogeneous, like patriarchal tiny units. And it's, so in that sense, I'm not so worried about, I'm very worried about Millet as a person, but I'm also worried about him as a kind of a transitional figure who introduces people to an even more poisonous set of political ideas, which could then, you know, be given a very, a very um, prominent sort of cheerleader um, in ways that we should be deeply concerned about. I, I mean, I'll answer the question in a second, but like it's it's worth noting that like the interesting thing about anarcho-capitalism is its universalism, right? I mean, one can be only so worried about a Hungarian nationalist in the sense that the only people this will really radicalize mostly be other Hungarians. But anarcho-capitalism at least has this potentially global sort of quality or a universal reach that could be replicated sort of, um, uh, you know, without end, sorry. Who's next? Hi, I have a very quick question, and it's about uh, a different, or the myth that actually market can exist without state. Yeah. And, and I don't know, maybe you, because um, I really find it interesting that it keeps being this differentiation of like market without state, state, with, and, but yeah. it's actually a myth that the one can exist without the other. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of one of the origins of this book, too, is like, 
the last book I published, and like I'm in a group of scholars who work on neoliberalism, and most of the time we just spend our time saying like, neoliberals don't want to get rid of the state. They just want to refashion the state. They want to redesign the state. The state does this instead of that. It's intensive rather than extensive. So that's like most of the stuff that we are doing pedagogically. But then there was this thing that was like always bugging me at the back of my head. I was like, but there are some people that really do want to get rid of the state. <laughs> like there are, they do exist. They're a minority. They're like marginalized. But for some reason there hadn't, like no one had written really about anarcho-capitalism. Um, because it seemed too weird. It's David Friedman rather than Milton Friedman. You know, he's not getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Instead, he's calling himself a Berber 11th century poet and like eating with his right hand. So it's easy to dismiss. But, you know, if one thing this Millet moment sort of um, tells us is that that idea remains quite attractive to people, like some of the idea of doing away with the government at all which you wouldn't think would be attractive. But if you've been living in Argentina for the last 20 years and you feel like the government has not been doing anything for you, then when someone says, fuck the government forever, you're like, yeah, yeah, fuck the government forever. Like, let's do it. Let's try it. Why not give it a shot? So that leaves us, the, you can understand the political attractiveness of the, the, the question, the, the practical problem of like, I personally agree with you. We travel back to 1920 in Berlin and tell someone on the street, why are you trying to create a communist society? Communism doesn't work. They might say communism has never been tried. Then just as the anarcho-capitalists would say, we have never actually tried to do it. We do have blueprints. We do have ideas of turning everything into an insurance company, a service provider. We can do security this way. We can do private health care that way. If you're in America, you already live in that world. Um, people will move from arbitration agencies to insurance agencies based on their performance. I mean, it's not like they haven't written, you know, hundreds of thousands of words <laughs> sketching out blueprints of how they think it will work. Um, whether or not we think it will actually work is, I think, you know, something that... Um, that something like the cryptocurrency experiment, you know, for them, it's like a proof of concept. Like, technically speaking, there's no central bank of Bitcoin, and yet people did seem to exchange it and consider it like a valuable asset. Obviously, it didn't rise to the status of money. But if you start to think that the things you need are already provided through private providers, then, again, I agree with you. But for them, it seems like this jump is not so far to say, what if this was all just being done entirely mediated through private actors? And, and that's the dream. That's the dream they hold on to, yeah, even if it's unlikely or even impossible. Dreams don't really have to be possible to be politically powerful, right? Okay. No, no, but go ahead. Why not? Because I think it's a different. Sorry, I think it's a different thing to like yeah. try to imagine different ways of a society, uh, or po of politically organizing oneself, uh -huh. or like economics, which works like on a different level. I think. I mean, not separated from the politics and from like beliefs, but like. The, the kind of like the, the possibility of dreaming or of like thinking of different models, I think, mm -hmm. differs where there are numbers or they're not. Well, I think, no, I th I'm, I'm glad you had that follow up because like I think it, it, it's like what is the, the unit that you're operating with, right? So for obviously communism, it's the working class and it, that is a potentially universal relationship to capital. And so that is the, your potential partners in building this community and thereby building a, p a political future. A lot of the modern period has been about the nation, has been the space within which you build a potential community of equals and like-minded people that you will eventually, you know, succeed, you know, in cooperation with. What's interesting for me about the anarcho-capitalist mobilization model is it's not class-based, 
actually. I mean, despite the fact that like a lot of very rich people are kind of drawn to it. That's not why all these people are voting for Millet and Bolsonaro and watching the YouTubes, right? It's, it's about these like affiliation groups that are like mediated through mostly online communities and that are premised on the idea of if you get in now, you might profit and you might succeed. If you don't, you're gonna, not only going to be poor, but you're going to be our enemy. So it's like a kind of molecular creation of like new kinds of communities, which is very different from class-based politics, very different from political party-based politics. Um, but I think does kind of model exactly a kind of geography of zoning or like micro political affiliations, right? Which could be, you know, more like clan-like, gang-like would be ways they'd often be happy to describe it um, that, so far, we, I don't think we've really considered that being like an important political counter model to nation-based politics, class-based politics, civilization-based politics, but this kind of like piecemeal, micro uh, relationship-based um, group building is I think that's something that we should probably think more seriously about, that through, especially through the affordances of the internet. I mean, I think someone like, Paolo Gerbaudo has written really well about this with the digital party and Oliver Nachtve and Caroline Amlinger are writing about this too with this new forms of kind of authoritarianism that proliferate that wouldn't otherwise if there weren't these ways of creating online communities. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I think this was a very rich description of the world that I came to live in the last couple of years, but especially as you were mentioning militarism in Bolsonaro, I was wondering if maybe that world has, st has started to change quite a bit, very radically in the last couple of months. Because it seems to me that one of the reasons why this national sovereignty model was so alluring in the 20th century is that it was a century of interstate war a century in which states actively needed citizens to be conscripted into military service. And I wonder if maybe we're going back to that world in a different way. And I just wonder if you can tell us more, how do the current global configurations fit or not with the sort of zone transformations? And if this kind of conversation around national security, national interest, even national industrial policy is maybe seeing or showing that we're going back in a way to the 20th century. Yeah, that the nation is not dead yet. I think that's, I think that's fair. I mean, I think that the U.S. is a great example, right? Because a lot of the things that Trump was doing from a point of view of economic nationalism, um, as soon as Biden was doing them, like everyone on the left side of the spectrum was suddenly okay with them and sort of began to live with things like trade wars and tariffs and stuff and realized the positive side of them. Um, I think that it's helpful if I think about the kind of world nation zone setup to not suggest, and I wouldn't want to, that everything is now shifted to zones. I think that if you look at the return of industrial policy or the way that the, in, the uh, IRA has worked in the United States or the sort of moves towards um, just energy transition in the EU, it's interesting, right? Because I think that if you look at the Hungary embracing special economic zones, Poland embracing special economic zones, which are based on um, creating diversity and kind of um, preference inside of nations to make things better for investors here rather than there. This is very much opposed to the European principle of like an even space of competition, right? And the reason why Poland and Hungary can do special economic zones for the most part is that they came in late and they already had them in place. So they were sort of grandfathered them back in. So I think that right now between like the special economic zone and the debt break, you have even like the competition of two forms of neoliberalism. Like either you lock in capitalism and its efficiencies by scaling up or you do it by scaling down. Contrary to that, you also have an, a competing idea within the EU, which is like fiscal generosity, a, 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 you know, a more interventionist state, um, creating this carbon border around the European Union to keep out, you know, high carbon imports. Uh, and that is, I think, a, a different political economic rationality. You mentioned Brazil. Obviously, Lula is operating by a different 
um, political economic imagination than Bolsonaro before him. So I don't think it's a done deal that one is going to win out or that we're sort of locked into this track towards like zonification. I think, but I think it is helpful to think about those different scales that some work by saying punch holes, some say reassert national control for a variety of reasons. And then some say put the nation inside of some kind of an institutional framework to, um, you know, encourage this or that outcome. Of course. Yeah, go for it. Just to make it more explicit, do yeah. you think that the return of international wars will change this? Right. Okay. How war fits into that. Um, well, I mean, one thing that we have learned, I think, since the outbreak of the, the war in Ukraine or the Russian invasion of Ukraine is in some ways kind of the limits of American power. I mean, I think that at, at the first instance, people thought that it was going to prove the, you know, the absolute omnipotence of the American dollar and that by locking Russia out of the dollar system through sanctions in a way that this would net, would like immediately strangle the Russian economy and we would you know realize that you know what the political scientists Henry Farrell and Abe Newman call like network empire or underground empire was a reality in fact it turned out that there was more sort of give and take inside of the world economy than that and Russia found trading partners beyond its own borders that had its own kind of flexibility. So I think that, you know, even in moments of serious mass conscription kind of conflict, and we're in a few of those right now, um, it's, there's, it's the sort of political geographies of the global economy have proven to be a bit more like labile and movable than I think people would have predicted. So the, the significance of the, BRICS world of, you know, which had been sort of forgotten about for some time. People were sort of reminded of it again when Russia had a rather large market for its oil in places like India and China and South Africa, and they could pick up a lot of the slack that they lost in Europe. And so that's another sort of tripartite version of the world, like US, Europe, BRICS, that, um, you know, also kind of complicates what can be a, an overly schematic, like either we're global or we're national kind of um, storyline. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I would like to come back to the, um, to the uh, strategy of zoning on both sides on the spectrum of uh, anarchism and the uh, neoliberal use of um, zoning on, on one side and, and more specifically on um, the anarchist side that historically always had, or more specifically, the, I'm interested in the relation to the outside. Then on the anarchist side, the anarchist communist side, there was always this idea that the zone is always a first step, yeah, where new forms of social relations are experimented with and new forms of solidarity. And of course, as you said, this is usually gets cracked down, but in the history of anarcho-communist thoughts, the communitarian project in the early 19th century, there was always this idea of expansion that was, this would roll like a wildfire across society and then you would have something like a federalist uh, world commune. But I had the feeling that this strategy of zoning uh, on, 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 the, on the right is more interested in, in containing, as you said, and, and why, why is that? Why, why is not this, 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 this drive that w if wealth is created in this zone, why not expand it further? Why, why, why is not the territory growing in that sense? Yeah, I mean, right. So I think that there's different histories of that on the left too, right? Like I think about the Paris Commune wanting to create sort of a network of like-minded communes that would sort of skip over the backward countryside, you know, to other cities, for example. But I think that this gets back to the original question about how this looks like empire. Um, what I think that a kind of baseline assumption that a lot of us have about what a nation is, is that a nation is somehow kind of like a material expression of the desires and dreams of its residents. So whether that tends in a direction that we dislike or we like, 
it's somehow internally produced and then, you know, extruded and like concrete made material as a nation. What I do think is kind of epochal or world historical about the zone as its arrival as a kind of political geographic unit is it's the opposite. So you design a zone with an indifference basically to the desires of the people inside the zone. You design the zone for the interests and wishes and dreams of people external to it. This became very clear in the case of Hong Kong. It's in a way, the beginning of this project was this really extraordinary moment where the Chinese Communist Party and Hong Kong business elites are negotiating the shape of what would become the Hong Kong Constitution or the basic law, as it was called. And what was amazing about it first, as people at the time thought, was that in a very surprising outcome, the Communist Party elites wanted basically the same thing as the Hong Kong real estate oligarchs wanted. They both wanted security of contract. They wanted locked in low tax rate. They wanted, um, they wanted uh, locked in free trade arrangements. Neither of them wanted democracy or an expansion of suffrage. Um, they both wanted to keep Hong Kong working exactly the way it was, not because of any concern for what the residents of Hong Kong wanted. It was never, they were never consulted, quite literally. It was a bilateral negotiation between the Communist Party elites and the Hong Kong business leaders. But because they knew that's what the business community wanted. And as one of them said sort of openly in the course of negotiation, if you expanded democracy, then you'd get people pushing back on tax rates. They'd be asking for more things and that would threaten credit worthiness. The Hong Kong credit rating might drop in the sort of global uh, bond markets and investor community. So I think that once you start thinking about political community as externally directed rather than internally produced, you've kind of, you've returned to the world of colonialism in the sense that a patch of territory is interesting only in so far as it's interesting for the metropole, it's interesting for the foreign investors. And you've also kind of, um, you've also sort of, you know, you've reversed the kind of promise of modernity and the promise of certainly popular sovereignty, but you've created a kind of bookmark around that era from sort of the Atlantic revolutions of French Revolution and the American Revolution to the rise of zoning, I would say, in the 1990s, when you say either we are going to now realize the dreams of people inside those um, territories in a sort of a backhanded way, which is we're going to bring people in as investors and then over time that's going to produce a positive outcome for them, which is the Chinese model, really. Like that's what Deng Xiaoping envisioned and, and sort of what happened. But you've also produced the possibility for what you're describing, which is like um, a, a much more kind of fine-grained vision of what the future is going to look like. So if you're a wealthy sort of secessionist um, member of the American elite, then you can say, this is brilliant. Now, we don't have to sort of make promises to the entire working class. We don't need to make promises based on ideas of birthright. We can just say, you're either in or you're out, and the area is just the size of a postage stamp. And we ne still need the world beyond it for inputs and arbitrage and the services they can provide. But the promise, the big promise of evenness, which is really, I think, the promise of the 20th century, the promise of equality, has been sort of designed out and written out sort of intentionally. Um, so what you're saying is why wouldn't they say, let it propagate? Well, they would say, well, that's what the 20th century already was, this big promise of like propagating prosperity through emulation, and it was a failure. And where we are now is like, history won't bring everyone with it. History is gonna leave most people behind. So you just wanna be on the lifeboat. Um, so we don't have much time left, so I'm going to ask one final question. I want to reply to what you just said, which is when you talk about a lifeboat, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about here uh, and is, of course, an <laughs> uh, important aspect of this is indeed like the question of survival 
of humanity mm -hmm. through environmental crisis and the secession of uh, populations from the baleful effects of, of climate destruction. So how much is that um, kind of theorized or, or openly discussed by the kind of theorists you're talking about in the book? I mean, it's mostly avoided. Uh, it's the idea of the, the threat of climate change and climate catastrophe, I think, is something that only matters if you think in terms of larger territories as kind of communities of fate and communities of mutual responsibility. I think once you have welcomed the idea of territorial fragmentation and the idea that you know those with the most means can find higher ground, then it's... A, Irrelevant. I mean, it's not an issue anymore, right? I mean, the, the answer is simple, which is you just find higher ground and you build the walls higher. And those sort of things are obviously already happening in the sense that, to use the language of zones, and I mentioned this at the end of the book, certain parts of the United States already even are being designated as like sacrifice zones, meaning that they cannot be saved from the erosion of the coastline or they cannot be saved from climate outcomes so that insurers won't step in to insure them at any reasonable price and people in some cases are being actively moved out and then other areas are being designated as you know r reserving of seawalls and protection and the habitus of the people in my book are ones who just assume they will be inside of the seawall i think that the um the example that's sort of related to that which i still like really cherish from um, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, which, by the way, is set in 2024, <laughs> um, is this example, and I, her book is set in 2024, and it's set in kind of like a more a progressed version of the world I'm describing in the fantasies of the anarcho-libertarians where there's no real state per se. People have withdrawn to kind of self-defending gated communities in the Los Angeles area. And the main character her family has been um, put under threat by the invasion of sort of bandits into their gated community. And so they have a choice, which is do they want to join this privately organized community on the coastline, which manages a desalination plant itself is owned by like a Canada, German, Taiwanese conglomerate or something very like nineties vision of the 2020s. Um, and if they entered, they would lose all rights as citizens, but they would have a place to sleep and they would have food and they would work. She's talking about it, thinking it over with her mom and the, her grandmother in the book. And she said, you know, I've read about this before. Like I read a lot of sci-fi and I always know that there are these company towns because that's another thing that haunts a lot of this too. It's right. It's not just colonies. They're company towns where... The script is the money you use, the land you live on is owned by the company, the clothes you own are paid for by the company. She's like, I've read about this a lot and it's always like the hero comes in and then overthrows the company town. And she's like, I know that in reality, it's never like that. In reality, we don't fight to get out of the company town, we fight to get in, right? And so I think that that, you know, looked at not from the point of view of the wealthy or the elites, but from the more powerless and disenfranchised, that's actually more the story is like this disgusting social contract that they're designing up will be eventually something that like more and more people will be forced to sign rather than voluntarily sign because under conditions of like shrinking control and shrinking um, possibilities for distribution of wealth, those, those resources will be harder to come by. So I think that's the kind of the inverted vision of the world that um, is painted here. Well, um, thanks a lot, uh, Quinn. And uh, the book is available at the stall at the front. So uh, thanks everyone for coming and thanks in particular.